Number 10, the griffin. More strong than eight lions and a hundred eagles. Originating in the Middle East and then being adopted in Greek literature, griffins are a majestic amalgamated blend of the body and back legs of a lion mixed with the wings, beak, and talons of an eagle. These mythical creatures were praised for the intelligence they apparently possessed, as well as the fact that they clearly had excellent patience as they mated with one other griffin for life. But don't think that makes them any less ferocious or fearsome. They would rip things apart with their giant beaks and talents and could fly victims to the skies. We believe the idea of the griffin was actually inspired when Scythian nomads interacted with dinosaur bones in Central Asia. Specifically, the bones of the dinosaur Protoceratops, which, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Kind of looks like a bird-like creature if you like tilt your head, maybe. Number nine, the Loch Ness Monster. Hi, lad. Be careful when you venture out into the water's depths. That deep water has a beast hidden, just waiting to spring up and cause trouble. Yes, the Loch Ness Monster, maybe the most famous of all the mythical creatures. No thanks, of course, to all the hysteria that surrounds the watery lass. Ever since a black and white photo from the 1930s emerged, so did interest in this mythological creature. Maybe because people were bored, gullible, or just the thought of a prehistoric animal still alive. In modern times, well, it was thought provoking. Some say it was a plesiosaur, some say it was a hoax, and funny enough, some think it was a whale's piece of deal, which I had to include because it's very funny. Honestly, Adam and I googled whale gabagool and compared the two images and uh, you know what? Yeah, that's my accepted theory now. It's probably, it was probably a whale gabagool. Number eight, a basilisk. If you think I mean the snake from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, then no. Well, yes, but also no. See, in the earliest mention of the basilisk in ancient Rome, it was a snake-like creature with a sort of crown. But then you fast forward to the Middle Ages and this thing is a serpent with the head of a rooster and the wings of a dragon or a bat. I don't know how we made that jump, but hey, that's just how she goes. It apparently had a very de-lifing bite and venom breath, which is interesting. But its main defense was the fact that it could end your time on Earth simply by looking at you. Sounds like my ex. No mention of petrifying people though. The basilisk supposedly originated in North Africa, but tales of European encounters are much more frequent. One particular incident from 1587 Poland tells us how a man clad in a mirror-covered suit hunted and captured a basilisk after it consumed two small girls. Mm. Number seven, Kraken. If nautical nonsense be something you wish, then ye came to the right place, sir. The Kraken, arguably the most terrifying sea monster ever. I know I said that before, but no, I said most infamous. Famous? I don't know. It's scary. I'd even argue it's scarier than the Megalodon. Put a Megalodon on land. He's basically an oversized Magikarp. Kraken? Ooh, those tentacles and suction cups, they're going to hurt. And but he's got reach. The Kraken in most depictions is a gigantic octopus or squid-like creature who can destroy large shipping vessels with its huge tentacles and send them down to Davy Jones' locker. In Norse mythology, some depictions of the Octo Beast are as big as islands, which, ooh, that's really big. Sometimes creatures like this in other mythological stories come with lessons or a, a tale of something. And usually these creatures have a weakness or an exploit on how to defeat such a beast. However, in my research, all it said was that they could be defeated, and not how. Number six, Blemier. Ready for a weird one? In ancient times, Europeans who traveled to North Africa and Asia came back telling some pretty crazy tales, specifically of humanoids who would wander the wilds. The absolutely weirdest one would have to be the Blemier from North Africa. They were big hairy dudes. That part ain't surprising, that's Big Chet over there. But they had no heads. Instead, they had a face on their chest, or even just eyes in the middle of their chest. I mean, look at the art our ancestors made of them. What even is that? Somebody call the police! <laughs> what the? They became a hot topic of interest and disgust and appeared in all kinds of stories and art at the time. I, for one, would never like to see them again. Thank you very much. I would never like to see that again. Thank you. Thank you. Number five, werewolf. Hey man, I, I just wanted to check up on you and make sure you're feeling all right. Uh, I know it was kind of strange that a large dog bit you in the full moon. Hey man, you're, you're a lot hairier than I remember you being. And, and gee, your teeth are pretty big too. Uh, say, what's that wagon going on behind you? Ah, I'm sure you're fine. Yes, werewolves, another classic, if you will. Part man, part wolf. And the ability to transform into said beast at a full moon. Some call it a power, some call it a curse. 
I think werewolves stand out on this list because they're so common. Werewolves were thought to be real in ancient Rome and most of medieval Europe. More interesting than a wolf that hungers for human flesh is the treatment for such an ailment. Some medieval remedies include hammering nails through hands. In Sicily, it was a knife through the skull three times. In Germany, if you said the person's Christian name three times, they would be cured. And in more recent times, silver. Just silver for some reason, or a silver bullet. So be mindful at night, folks. You may just need a hammer, nails, knife, Bible, telephone book, and a couple quarters for the telephone book so you can look up the Christian names. Number four, Slepnir, the steed of none other than Odin himself. Sleipnir, or the sliding one of Norse mythology, was an eight-legged gigantic black horse that could carry itself and its rider across the land, sea, and through the air. Those eight massive powerful legs also helped bring Odin Allfather from the realm of Asgard to Midgard, or Earth, and I'm sure Sleipnir could bring him to all the other realms as well. Sleipnir here came to be when the god Loki shapeshifted into a mare and became pregnant by the stallion of a giant. Well, that's how the myth goes. Look, I can't come up with this stuff, okay? Just believe me so we can move on. In art, the giant horse was the means of transportation used by shamans in their travels throughout the cosmos. So when they were straight up tripping on the magical mushrooms over in the forest clearings of Norway. Number three, dragon. Greetings, foul beast, for I am Sergenicus, knight of the not so round table. I have come to skewer your winged wickedness and end your sour reign, is what I would say if I was a knight in shining armor with a broadsword and a shield. It's a classic story. There's always a knight and there's always a dragon that needs slaying. In European culture, dragons are depicted as large winged creatures, sometimes with the ability to breathe fire. Perhaps a representation or euphemism for a great challenge a knight may face. In Eastern culture like China, dragons have no wings and are more snake-like. However, both still look similar and both have the ability of flight. The Chinese dragon may also uh, be able to use magic, so a fire breather and sorcery. Ooh, somebody get my sword. It's gotta go. No, bad. Number two, Aramanthian boar. Hey, do you remember in the ancient extinct creatures video where we talked about Andrew Sarkis, Andrew's ancestor? Well, I think, I think this is it. A one ton boar with sharp and strong canine teeth. Only this one's in ancient Greece, not Mongolia, so maybe not. But the Aramanthian boar was part of the 12 heroic labors performed by the demigod Hercules. Hercules was tasked with capturing the boar that would come out every day and attack the people who lived by the Aramanthus mountain. Now, I don't know if you know, but boars are already just angry, jumped up pigs that have been known to literally end people's whole existences. So yeah, size those bad boys up with giant tusks and well, good luck Hercules. It is also said that the boar was actually the god Apollo in different form, but ah, I'm just gonna say it was Andrew Sarkis, even though I'm 99% sure they were extinct at the time of the ancient Greeks. Number one, mermaids. Ladies, you gotta put yourselves in our shoes. Imagine Adam and me on a vessel in the ocean for months on end, starving, thirsty, and lost. But I can always get lost in your eyes. Anyway, <laughs> suddenly some thick fog breaks, and there upon some shallow rocks is a woman who's missing her blouse and has a fish's lower half for her lower half. How can I not stop and ask for help and or directions? Of course every fish lady wants to be around men who haven't had a good wash since they left port. The myth all makes sense. In a nutshell, that's what it is. The only difference is whether or not the mermaid is going to help you or bring you to your demise. We'll see, I don't know. Kicking off our list at number 10, Christopher Columbus. Ah yes, the classic. On his first trip overseas in 1493, Christopher Columbus claims to have seen not one, not two, but three mermaids. Yeah, he even wrote about it. He said they rose well out of the sea, but they are not so beautiful as they are said to be. Yeah, for their faces had some masculine traits. Awesome, okay, that's good to know. They're actually not that attractive because they look like guys. Awesome, thanks Chris, that's good to know. Maybe you should have kept your eyes on the road rather than, you know, trying to spot mermaids. History would have been a little different had you have done that. Historians believe that Columbus may have gotten confused, <laughs> classic, and he may have saw manatees instead of mermaids. Their skin is pink and fleshy, so you know what, to be fair, that's a common mix up, I guess. Maybe that's what everyone's been seeing this whole time. Still, I wanna believe, right? So do you. Number nine. Captain John Smith. Another sea captain, another claim. Who is it this time? Not the great Captain John Smith, famous for settling Jamestown. He didn't see a mermaid in 1614, did he? 
Oh, he did, I knew it. The same captain famous for his relationship with Pocahontas almost got into an entanglement with some mermaids, it seems. He spotted a mermaid off the coast of Newfoundland, apparently, and he couldn't keep his eyes off of her. Yeah, this one was attractive. Not all of them are ugly, apparently, Chris Columbus. He noted for her long green hair and parted to her an original character that was by no means unattractive. Yeah, you ever get caught checking out another girl by accident? Just, just try that, I guess. I was imparted in her long green, by no means unattractive hair. I'm sorry. I'm only human, geez. Smith noted her large eyes, fine nose, and well-formed ears. Slight roast, but you know what? I'll take it. Once he realized her bottom half was fishy, he bolted. He was like, you know what? No deal for me. Sorry, I gotta go. I have standards, okay? He's like, green hair, nice. Fins, eh, not so pleasant. See you later. Number eight, Jenny Hanover's. Right, we've all heard about this one. Back in the 1500s, numerous mermaids were appearing in Antwerp. They had appeared so often that sailors had a name for them. They were called Jenny Hanovers. Not only did they approach tourists, so scary, but they were also apparently business as well. They would sell objects to said tourists. Yeah, imagine hanging out by the sea one day and a man fish approaches you, trying to sell you some cigars. That'd be awful. They were also referred to as devilfish, which makes more sense. And perhaps they were the enemy of Christ. I don't know, it really depends which book you read, which rendition of mermaid you're gonna get. Some are terrifying, some just wanna sell you some beads. I don't know. Number seven, whales. I mean whales as in the place, not whales as in, you know, this list is on mermaids, you get it. In 1603, off the coast of Wales, numerous reports were flooding in about a sea creature, humanoid, fish, merman thing, yeah. This time it wasn't a sailor. It wasn't a dehydrated, confused guy on a boat. No, this time it was near Pendeen. A farmer named Thomas Reynold first saw it nearby on the shores. And then, like a normal dude, called others over. He was like, ah, I can't take photos. We don't have that yet, so. Come here, please come here and look at this. And they all stood by and watched this thing splash around for three hours. All the accounts were collected, and since it was 1603, some guy had to draw it. Yeah, that's the best way we can describe history. Some guy's like, uh, hold on. This was the closest they could get. I mean, that's believable and all, but I really hope this was a mermaid, or else, I don't know, a bunch of guys gathered around and watched some fish. Mate, probably. It's pretty hilarious. Number six, sirens. Ben Stiller may think that he's a glamorous merman, but in the 13th century Norwegian manuscripts, these fish-human hybrids were described in a different way. They were terrifying. Yeah, they weren't models this time around. I'm fairly positive if mermaids were and are real, they're not like Ariel at this point. Yeah, it's kind of hard to sing under the sea when a plastic bag floats into your face. Our oceans are a bit doomed, but who knows? Mermaids could be. These mermaids were referred to as sirens, of course. They were monsters described as tall and great of size. Shoulders like a man, but no hands. Whenever said monster would appear, historically, doom was meant to follow. That's a pretty dark description for such a lovely thing like a mermaid. When the 18th century rolled in, Europeans in the Dutch Indies discovered plants and creatures that had never been seen before. So they would, of course, document these discoveries in detail. And in 1718, a painter named Samuel Flores claimed to have discovered and caught a real siren. He brought her into his home, apparently, and he drew this on the spot because, again, he had to. And after day four of living in a container of water, the mermaid purposely didn't eat and starved herself to death. Yeah, she refused to eat. What a ride or die. Again, this was 1718, so part of me thinks, why lie? Know what I mean? I mean, we make up stories and movies and all that jazz now, but back then, I don't know, it feels not wise to waste resources drawing mermaids and lying. Also, the fact that other sightings were accurate, like other plants, I don't know, makes the mermaid more convincing when it's in the same book. Number five, selkies. Ah, selkies, here we go, that's a load of fun. You would remember these ones, I think, if you saw them, I would hope. Selkies were described as a sea lion, almost, only there's a noticeable feature here that sets them apart. They can shed their skin and then later take on the form of a human. So, a little different than the other sea lions that were used to, I guess. Their origins go back to the shores of Orkney and Shetland. So, Scottish, I love it. Yes, I live in Shetland, the weather's shit. One tale is pretty haunting. I'm for sure counting this as a curse, I don't know. When a female Selkie shed her skin once, a sailor captured it. Now, he didn't know what he was in for because after he caught her, they were then forced into marriage. Yeah, gotta read the fine print, my guy. Can't just super like mermaids and then just bail, okay? You gotta commit. If the Selkie were to ever find her skin, like her original sea lion fish form, only then could she return to sea. But after that point, her husband would pass away instantly. And apparently, this happened. 
this was a thing that happened in history, how horrible. The ultimate right swipe, what a curse that is. If you're ever fishing or sailing in the high seas near Scotland, anything that resembles a sea lion, don't get close, you know, don't marry it, I guess. Number four, Roman sea curse. The first century, a good place to begin with most things that are horrible, I guess. Romans did things a little bit differently. We can't figure it out how they engineered aqueducts or how that many people watched Colosseum battles. You know what I mean? Ancient Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder wrote a book on natural history, and in said book, this go-to, may I remind you, on ancient history, the Elder wrote about half-human, half-fish creatures that he called Nereids. Yeah, he even added to his first observation detailing that the human parts of the body were covered in rough scales. Yeah, gross, I guess. Human in appearance, but still fishy nonetheless. How do we, how do we overlook this in history? The elder also recalls a seaman who would climb ships at night and then purposely sink them. Yeah, like Aquaman, only he stinks and he's horrible and he's not handsome like Jason Momoa. Number three, Kai Islands. Back in 1943, Japanese soldiers were posted up on the Kai Islands in Indonesia. They claimed to have run into a mermaid numerous times, the same one. On the Kai Islands, multiple encounters with multiple mermaids, this was a common theme. The villagers referred to these creatures as orang ikan. Orang translates to human and ikan to fish. So human fish, you get it, not orangutan. A little bit different. While on patrol, Sergeant Taro Hariba had instructed the village chief to pass on any and all information if anybody sees one of these things, right? Of course, we gotta keep our eyes open for possible sea monsters. Well, somebody saw one and captured it, and Sergeant Hariba recalls the mermaid as being around five feet tall. Her skin was pink and its face was human, but it had spikes around their head, and also its mouth was that of a fish's mouth. So yeah, pretty hard to forget, I would say, slash hope. This was 1943, so the scientific community wasn't exactly sold, so nothing ever came from this, but again, I don't know, I weirdly believe in this one. A carp mouth is more believable than silver blonde hair singing by the beach, know what I mean? Number two, Kalua Papa. Heading over to the beautiful Hawaii for this one. I always wanted to go, but it's so far away, so I don't think I'll ever make it. Also, it's drowning, I'm pretty sure. This was once referred to as the most cursed place on Earth. The coast of Malacca sounds like a good time on paper, and from Google Earth, it certainly looks like a fair weekend getaway. But for over 100 years, this was an isolation coast for patients with leprosy. Yeah, that of course had to change sometime, and those laws did in 1969. Right now, barely anybody is living on that part of the island due to its haunted past, and of course, mermaid sightings. You guessed it, always something. Leprosy was considered a curse back then, but even when help became available, some elderly patients stayed. So there's now a few thousand people that are stuck on the island for, you know, almost 10 years. That's great. It's kind of horrifying. This is a cursed island. That's got a lot of bad in there. And finally, number one, oh, Canada. Being a Canadian, we have to end on a Canadian sighting of a mermaid, of course. This one was reported back in 1967 in British Columbia, when a group of tourists were on a ferry, they apparently saw a fish person, a mermaid, a siren, whatever you wanna call it. They all thought they saw a legit mermaid because of their silvery blonde hair. It was one of those, you know, cute ones, I guess, not one of those fishy monster ones that climbs ships. Was she splashing around in the shallow water, doing backflips as she jumped over waves? No and no, she was actually enjoying lunch. Yeah, the tourists all report that this mermaid was eating a salmon while the waves crashed over her tail. Apparently she was just eating raw fish. Apparently it was not the best sight to see. The city was jazzed about this, I guess, so they put out a reward for $25,000 for this mermaid. They took it seriously, so who knows? Maybe it did actually happen in real life. Starting our list off at number 10, Lilith. Lilith is a female demon, and sometimes she's seen as a sex goddess, so... That's neat, that's a good way to start a list off right there. She first appeared in ancient Mesopotamian and Jewish folklore. In Mesopotamian mythology, she was a winged demon who preyed on pregnant women. Yeah, not so fun after all, it seems. In Jewish tradition, Lilith was believed to be Adam's first wife before Eve, who, rumor has it, refused to submit to him and left the Garden of Eden to hook up with demons. Yeah, which is a little more of a different route than what we would have done. Instead, giving birth to monstrous offspring in, you know, the underworld. I like that version more, personally. That one feels like a Thor installment. I'd watch that in IMAX. Over time, Lilith's story became associated with other beliefs. Today, it's kind of funny. She's seen as a feminist icon almost in modern times. But Lilith remains a prominent figure in various forms of literature, art, and pop culture. If you ask Siri about Lilith, it's really 50-50 about what kind of story you're gonna get. Sex goddess or demon? Who knows? Number nine, Spring-Heeled Jack. 
<clears throat> Heading to ye olden days, medieval England, Springheeled Jack was a mysterious character slash demon slash we have no idea, superhero, not really sure. He emerged somewhere in the 19th century in London, England. He was described as a tall, thin, and agile figure with red eyes, clawed hands, and this one might be a little bit obvious, but he also has the ability to jump over buildings. So again, pretty obvious who he is. spring -Heeled Jack was known for attacking women, but often breathing blue flames and causing them to faint or suffer from shock. Yet more than fair with the flame thing. His identity and motives still remain unknown, with some theories suggesting that he was a supernatural being or possibly, hear me out, an escaped convict. Yeah, you know, he escaped by leaping out of the prison with his blue fire breath. Many believe that this was the infamous Jack the Ripper, because spring -Heeled Jack, Jack the Ripper, I guess they're similar, but they both became a popular figure in Victorian literature and folklore, inspiring numerous sightings and stories. And he might be a demon, so who knows. Number eight, Apophis. Apophis was an ancient Egyptian god associated with chaos, darkness, and destruction. So more of a demon, I would say, on the demon list. He was depicted as a serpent or a dragon and was believed to be the enemy of the sun god, Ra. Now Apophis was thought to reside in the underworld and he attempted to prevent Ra from completing his journey through the night sky. Yeah, what a nuisance, right? Hate when that happens. I'm trying to fly to work and then Apophis gets all up in my sh It's the worst. I'm like, get out of here, dude. The ancient Egyptians believed that Apophis needed to be defeated in order for the sun to rise and then fall every day. So they performed rituals and spells to protect Ra and ensure, you know, the continuation of the world. We wouldn't mind that. Apophis remains an important figure in Egyptian mythology and has been the subject of many, many artistic and literary works throughout history. Because yeah, of course, who doesn't want to paint a demon dragon from ancient Egypt? I want to study that in school. Where was that? Number seven, Wiro. Wiro is popular in New Zealand. It's a figure in the mythology of Maori people. He's considered the god of darkness, evil, and death. Set on harming humanity. Yeah, how lovely does all those things sound? According to the Maori mythology, Wiro was one of the children of Rangiuni, the Sky Father, and Papatuanuku, the Earth Mother. He was born in the underworld and he was jealous of his brothers who lived in the world above. More than fair, it's all hot and stuffy down there. I'd want out too, fair. It was believed that Wiro could cause illness or misfortune to those who displeased him. So you better smash that thumbs up and hit subscribe, all that good stuff, you know, just to be safe. Never know. Number six, Lamashtu. Mesopotamian goddess of disease, infertility, and childbirth. Nice, real tender one, this one. She was believed to be a demon who preyed upon pregnant women only. So specific and so horrible. God, some of these are kind of cool, some of them are just all bad, like this one. Lamashtu was often depicted as a female figure with a lion's head, donkey's teeth, and wings. So a little silly, but also quite terrifying. This is what happens when donkey and dragon hook up in Shrek. You get this monster coming out. It's not so fun. When it's not animated, it's disastrous. It's a monster. Lamashtu was believed to have the ability to harm people through various means devouring them, stealing you from your home, causing you to fall ill, pretty much anything, no escaping this one. To protect against Lamashtu's influence, pregnant women were often given amulets or protective charms. Lamashtu was also associated with witchcraft and was said to have the ability to shapeshift into various animal forms, so be on the lookout for every and all of the animals. Could be demons, who knows? Number five. Asog, not to be confused with ASAP, not the same at all. My autocorrect was not, I'm like, no, that's not the one. Asog is a demon from Sumerian mythology who is associated with disease and destruction. The two Ds you don't want right there. Not D&D, &D, the fun ones, the D&D, &D, the bad ones. According to legend, he was born from the god Anu and the goddess Ki, but was rejected by both of them, yikes, because of his monstrous appearance. That's sad, that's pretty sad. They both rejected him because of his looks. Like, guy, you made this. What are you talking about his looks? That's half you. Asog is depicted it as a large horned creature with a scaly body and sharp claws, said to bring chaos and fear wherever he goes. Yeah, definitely. Asog is often associated with the spread of illness and pestilence. Now, Sumerian mythology really did not like this one. Some versions of the myth would have Asog be defeated by the god Ninurta, who uses the power of the storm to vanquish the demon and, you know, restore order to the world which, yay. So unless you have a storm lying around anywhere, it's gonna be a tough fight. You're probably gonna lose this one. Number four, Floros. Floros is a fun one. As far as appearances go, he's a little different. Not so much a dragon this time around, so that's great. Floros was said to have the power to cause destruction and chaos. Now, according to some accounts, he would appear as a leopard or as a man with the wings of a griffin. <laughs> Two very different descriptions, but I'll take it. I like the cheetah version a bit more. He looks so vulnerable that way. He looks like he's like naked, like he forgot a towel after he showered. I don't know. As far as demons go, not as intimidating. But as far as powers go, he packs a punch. Fluoros is associated with fire and is said to have the ability to control 
or summon it, just like that. How fun. Yeah, flame on, I guess. I'm never sleeping again. Floros is also known for his ability to reveal hidden secrets and to protect those who summon him. So if your homie's with him, you're good. Otherwise, fire and silly walks are coming your way. It's said he should only be summoned by experienced practitioners of the occult. So no amateurs allowed, just people that are OG with the occult and you're good. Number three, Incubi and Succubi. Two for the price of one. Let's go, why not? Incubi and Succubi, these supernatural creatures are from various cultural and religious traditions. So, you know, pick your poison. They're often described as demons that prey on humans during sleep, so. Yeah, say goodbye to your eight hours. Incubi, they're male demons who visit women in their dreams, often for sexual purposes, yikes. While succubi, they're female demons who visit men in their dreams. They're the, they're the Bonnie and Clyde of confusing dreams, I guess. In some traditions, they're believed to have been the offspring of fallen angels and mortal women. The legends of incubi and succubi have actually been used to explain sleep paralysis. So I hope that didn't just ruin your day. His and her demons, how cute. Number two. Baphomet. Baphomet is a deity that originated in medieval European occultism and has since been associated with various mystical practices, as are all of these. They're just used many a times in many a places. Baphomet is typically depicted as, well, you'd guess, the classic winged humanoid disgusting looking figure with a goat's head and scary horns, but here's where Baphomet dare I say, here's where they stand out. They're often seated on a throne with an inverted pentagram symbol. Yeah, this guy sounds a bit familiar, doesn't he? Baphomet has been associated with various occult concepts such as the union of opposites and the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment, which is, I mean, don't Google those, that's for sure. In modern times, Baphomet has been adopted by various groups and movements, including that of Satanism and the occult. This is our OG Satan right here. That's him, I guess. I say our, like I'm part of the cult. I don't know, that was weird. The earliest reference to Baphomet is a letter written by French crusader back in 1098. So yeah, keep an eye out if you see a demon humanoid on the Iron Throne. I guess watch out for that guy, sure. And finally, number one, Leviathar. The best for last, in my opinion. The goddess of death and pain, according to Finnish mythology. We'll finish with the Finnish. There we go. She's also known as the Lady of the North, which sounds like a character from Game of Thrones, but she was a little more haunting than the naked red witch was. Yeah, a little different looking, that's for sure. And she's believed to be the daughter of the god of the underworld, so daddy issues for sure, probably. Leviathar is described as a tall woman with pale complexion, dressed in all black clothing, and she's associated with disease, plague, suffering, pain, illness, all that good stuff, and is said to have given birth to nine diseases. Nine. Not two, not three, just nine diseases. Couldn't get enough of them, just here. Take them all, why not? Leviathar was feared and respected by the ancient Finns, and offerings were made to her in times of illness or calamity. Her influence can still be seen in modern Finnish culture and folklore. Again, creating nine diseases, yeah, we're probably gonna talk about her for a few years. Like, don't, don't do that maybe. One, fine, maybe one to build character, but nine diseases? Too much. Number 10, the woolly mammoth. What two things are big, loud, hairy, smell like Parmesan cheese, and frequent the New York area? If you said Ray Romano and woolly mammoths, then you're correct. It all comes full circle. Starting off with an easy one for you today, and folks, it's one of my favorites. A creature that's been long extinct. Comedians and primetime family sitcoms. No, I'm just kidding. I'm talking about woolly mammoths, the large animals that once roamed the earth. Since these are so common, I thought it would be very fun to do a tale of the tape. Standing anywhere between 2.7 to 3 point meters tall in the red corner, weighing in a full six tons, the beast from the east, woolly mammoth. Okay, well, they weren't just found in the east, but they were big and interesting creatures, especially since this is one of the few ancient species that we've ever interacted with. Having thick skin and fur made them difficult to hunt. It would take a few blows. However, if a smaller one was taken, it would make for a lasting meal. Interesting creatures. Number nine, Glyptodon. Take an armadillo, size that bad boy up, give it a spicy tail, take away its ability to curl up in a ball, and make it stupid looking, and you've got the 10 foot long, one ton glyptodon that lived 2 million to 10,000 years ago. Now, it would be easy to mistake this guy with a turtle or a tortoise, but it was in fact a mammal. It also had a soft underbelly that any predator able to flip over this walking Volkswagen beetle would be able to exploit. These guys were native to South America, and like I said, they actually were around for a long time, living just past the last ice age. It's believed like with most things, us humans had a not so small part to play in their disappearance from this world. We would hunt them for food and for their shells, which evidence says ancient man used as shelter from snow and rain. Number eight, Titanoboa. I actually didn't know this one existed either. There's gonna be a trend of large and scary animals here. 
Well, in the northeastern part of Colombia, a true beast lay still in the jungle, just waiting for a prey to dare come across its path. What would a titan boa do if prey came its way? Well, just like its smaller counterpart, it would constrict until you went for a big nap where you would then most likely be swallowed whole. Ugh. Well, at least that's what horror films would want you to think. As recent studies suggest, they may have actually only had a diet of fish. If you've ever been on a school field trip to a zoo and got to pet the animals, the boa constrictor is always one of those animals. I don't know why, they always got one on hand. Just in their, in their pocket, it's weird. Wouldn't fit, but... Which I don't know why, because if you've ever felt the power of those muscles, well, it would be a very memorable field trip. Just try and imagine that upscale by 10. I'm glad this one went extinct a long time ago. That's too big of a snake. Too much power. Too, too much. Number seven, Basilosaurus. When I hear the word basil, I think of a lovely smelling herb. Oh, I think of old Basil, a kind old man, probably with white hair and a big bald spot and a mustache. Now, thanks to this video, I will think of a 65 foot long sea monster with a three foot head and a bite force as strong as a T-Rex. Whales have been around for a heck of a long time, and they have had many different ancestors and cousins. All of them were different levels of odd and terrifying. Basil here was one of the earliest identified ones. It was fairly different from its modern descendants, as you can tell from these pictures. It had a longer eel-like body with that tiny head. It only weighed about 10 tons, which is odd for a whale. Being the ancestor of whales, Basilosaurus is a marine mammal, but for a long, long time it was actually mistaken for a marine reptile, like the Mosasaur, being given the nickname King Lizard, which is doubly odd because it wasn't even the biggest whale species. That would be the Leviathan Killer Whale. I think I remember why I'm terrified of the sea, yeah. Number six, Sabertooth Tiger. What's scarier than a full-grown tiger? How about a fully-grown tiger with teeth the size of bowie knives? Wow. Sometimes nature is scary and makes me question reality. The saber-toothed tigers are one of those things. A saber-toothed tiger's diet consisted of large animals, so watch out Willie Mammoth and maybe Ray Romano. Obviously most recognized for the protruding large canine teeth that sit outside the mouth even when closed, making for great puncture weapons, as if the large cats needed any more help hunting their prey. Coming into being around the same size as a large Siberian tiger, this is one hefty kitty, and one you wouldn't want to mess with. Fortunately for me, and the club of extremely cute gentlemen who cannot run very fast, I do not have to worry about outrunning this speedy, beefy predator. Their extinction is connected to both climate change and a lack of food. Number five, the giant sloth. If all of your information about prehistoric giant ground sloths was gathered from watching the animated Ice Age movies, buckle up. For starters, some of these guys were as big as elephants and one of the biggest land mammals. Other versions were as big as oxen or bears, so these suckers were pretty beefy, which I'm sure Sid the Sloth would be happy to hear. They also mostly walked on all fours, although they probably did stand on their hind legs to reach the top of trees and possibly as a defensive tactic. Ice Age was somewhat correct about how they were a little odd. For example, they probably did actually waddle thanks to their giant feet. They also oddly had teeth on the sides of their mouths used for crushing plants. The giant ground sloths are unsurprisingly related to our modern day sloths, but also to anteaters and armadillos. They were mainly South American mammals, but had different versions all over the Americas from 35 million to 11,000 years ago, until around the time of the Ice Age. Number four, Gigantopithecus. Put your hands together if you wanna clap as I take you through this monkey rap. DK, Donkey Kong, you know what I'm saying? Ah, great game. Although I never understood why his name is Donkey Kong. I digress. Why am I bringing up one of Nintendo's beloved mascots? Well, that's because I'm talking Giant Ape, baby. That's right. Gigantopithecus was a large ape that lived in Southeast Asia, some parts of China, and Vietnam. Coming in at a whopping 660 pounds, DK here would need to eat a lot of plants, which, judging by teeth and molars and other great apes, suggests he was a herbivore. I hope. I'm just gonna keep calling him DK because otherwise I'll be here all day with my dyslexia, but DK is most closely related to orangutans. However, 100,000 years ago, after some severe climate changes and food shortages, DK was no more. And it was game over. Number three, Terror Bird. Such a fitting name. This carnivorous bird became the top predator in South America after the dinosaurs went bye-bye. This bird had about 25 different species, ranging from one to three meters or 10 feet in height. That's a big bird. 
Some species could have been scavengers, but others, oh, they were definitely apex predators. Some had big, strong, stout legs that were probably good for kicking prey or even crushing bones with big curved claws or talons for stabby behavior. They had big skulls with bones that were fused together, unlike a lot of birds, which was probably useful for pecking things into the afterlife with their massive sharp beaks that were also likely useful for getting big, nasty, fleshy bites. Their closest living relatives in South America today take out their prey by picking it up and slamming it into the ground over and over and over and over again. So imagine that, but from a giant 10 foot angry ostrich with a giant beak. So yeah, terror bird, it's a good name. Number two, giant beaver. Yeah, my Aunt Flo used to have a bear-sized beaver. Too bad it ran away. Okay, all jokes aside, giant beavers, also known as castoroids, that's a strange name, first discovered in the very busy and important state of Ohio back in 1837, these fossils pop up anywhere from Toronto all the way down to Florida. Hmm. Getting as large as seven feet long and just shy of 300 pounds. This is a beaver whose dam you don't want to break. Despite how awesome the giant beavers were, they are now extinct. And despite the Hudson Bay companies or the dismay of French Canadian fur trappers, the beaver went extinct thousands of years ago. Today we are unsure what made them go extinct. Today we are unsure what made them go extinct. Some suggest hunting, uh, but we're not even sure if they existed along early humans. All I know is that a tail on that bad boy would be very dangerous. Seriously, people don't think the beavers are dangerous, but you gotta be careful around them. And I salute the beaver as it is Canada's national animal after all. Number one, Andrew Sarkis. And here we are, Andrew's ancient relative, the Andrew Sarkis. The name Andrew Sarkis was given as a dedication to Roy Chapman Andrews, who I share a last name with, so maybe I'm related too. Who can say? Andrews, such a unique name, isn't it? Which is fitting, because this bad boy right here was unique. Its massive three-foot skull was very similar to a wolf skull, but its jaw and tooth structure made it more like a mesonicket, which are related to horses and deers, but also relatives to whales and hippos. It was a giant hoofed carnivore, like a mix between a pig and a wolf, but massive. It probably ate literally anything it could get its jaws around. It could have been anything from tinier mammals to plants and roots to giant herbivores related to rhinos. If I ran into a huge hoofed pig wolf capable of taking down rhinos, I'd just lay down and give up. Luckily, it lived 45 to 35 million years ago in Asia, specifically the area around and near modern day Mongolia. And Andrew Sarkis did not adapt well to the changing times and didn't last as long as other ancient creatures on this list. Just like Andrew, we're still trying to figure out exactly what kind of animal Andrew Sarkis was. Number 10, the Main Island Mermaid. Okay, back in 1967, a fairy with tourists was astonished to spot this blonde mermaid on a beach. Yeah, casual, nice tour right there. The people who saw this marine creature, humanoid being, they said that she seemed to be eating a raw salmon fish while enjoying the waves splashing upon her, right? Just a nice lunch that we're interrupting, okay. A similar mermaid spotting incident was reported that same week, although a lot of people didn't believe that it was real. Charles White from the Undersea Gardens, this guy, he needs answers apparently and he's even going as far as to offer a $25,000 reward for the mermaid's capture. Being on film, camera, you got a cage or something, I don't know. You gotta prove it's real. He even went as far as to say that he would offer a room for the mermaid with whatever she likes. Okay, now it's getting a little weird, guy. It's a bit odd. But sure, let's go with it. Let's imagine this happens. To our surprise, nobody was able to capture or find the mermaid yet, so here I am to refuel this fire. Let's go looking. We can split it 25 ways. One grand each, easy. That's good. We'll go buy some new bathing suits to mermaid hunt. Number nine, Kiryat Haim Beach. Back in 2009, this huge incident had the media, the public, everybody really, even the government, all trying to get answers. What did they see? What's out there? What's splashing about? This one's pretty convincing, I'll admit. Honestly, it's weird. A mermaid sighting on Kiryat in Israel back in 2009 was described by a witness as, again, a creature. A creature that resembled a young woman who would often be found on the beach doing tricks in the water. Again, just a mermaid made doing kickflips off the dock. What, what's going on over there? They kept seeing her for a number of days, so eventually word started to spread and questions started to follow. Now it took a while for the news to spread and reach the general public and get the government involved, like for real, but when the government did finally get involved, they issued a $1 million reward for anybody who could provide solid proof of said mermaid's existence. Okay, forget the main island mermaid. Let's all go look for this one. Much better reward. A million? Splitting 25 ways, that's great. Capturing the mermaid was 
was not necessary, and just a photo would suffice. So that creepy guy who's got a room and board for that mermaid chick and you know, just maybe stay out of this one. One night, an NBC filming crew actually claimed to have seen a human figure dipping into the water. But again, this could have been just a normal human being dipping into the water. But again, who knows at this point? Imagine that, you're trying to go for a swim, a news crew just runs in after you. They're like, wait, 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 wait. Number eight, siren history. Okay, let's go back to where these first mermaid sightings occurred. Written in a 13th century Norwegian manuscript, 13th century, these fishy human hybrids were described as terrifying. And I'm fairly positive if Mermaids are real. They're not like aerial at this point, right? With our pollution, our world. Are you kidding me? They're probably like the shape of water with like a plastic bag hanging out of their head. Probably like some Last of Us ocean type looking thing. These mermaids were referred to back then as sirens or monsters. They were described as tall and great of size. They had shoulders like a man. That's how you know it's old school. Shoulders like a man, but they had no hands. So they were just scary looking shoulder things. Whenever the monster would appear, historically doom was meant to follow. It was a bad omen, just like a passing comet in the sky. It's beautiful in literature and in history, but in real life, probably pretty terrifying. Not a good omen, not good. Doom is heading our way, apparently. So when the 18th century finally rolled in, Europeans and the Dutch Indies discovered plants and creatures that had never been seen before. So of course they would document these discoveries in great detail. And in 1718, a painter named Samuel Fellours claimed to have discovered and caught a siren. Yeah, he brought her into his home apparently and then drew this image on the spot and a big description. And after day four of living in a container of water, the mermaid purposely didn't eat and then starved herself to death. Yeah, she refused to eat. What a ride or die mermaid. Again, this was 1718, so part of me thinks, why lie? I mean, especially back then. It doesn't feel wise to waste resources drawing up mermaids and, you know, fancy ideas. But then again, say we make like, you know, Star Wars, so who knows? Also, the fact that this is accurate to other sightings around the world in different countries in different centuries, it's a tad convincing. Number seven, Captain John Smith. The great Captain John Smith, he was famous for settling Jamestown, but he also is famous for seeing a mermaid back in 1614. Yeah, that's, take that with a grain of salt. The same captain famous for his relationship with Pocahontas. Almost got into an entanglement with some mermaids, it seems. He spotted a mermaid off the coast of Newfoundland, apparently. He couldn't keep his eyes off her, of course. This guy was desperate on the seas. He's looking at mermaids and probably a manatee and he's daydreaming about hooking up with her. It's not great. He noted her long green hair that was imparted to her an original character that was by no means unattractive. Yeah, you ever get caught checking out another girl? Try that. Be like, but babe, I was imparted in her long green hair by no means as unattractive. I'm only human, you know? I mean, this guy was only human back then. He saw something with big eyes and a fine nose with well-formed ears. Do you think it was a mermaid? Probably not. Probably not. All those guys back then were bad at observing stuff. Number six, Jenny Hanners. Back in the 1500s, numerous mermaids were appearing in Antwerp. Now, they had appeared so often that sailors eventually made a name for them. They were called Jenny Hanovers. And not only did they approach tourists, which is, I guess, terrifying, but they were also all business as well. They would sell objects to tourists. Yeah, imagine hanging up by the sea and a man fish approaches you trying to sell you a cigar. I'd be like, no thank you. What the fuck is that guy also? They were also referred to as devil fish and perhaps they were the enemy of Christ. Yeah, that's what we think of when we watch Aquamarine, the enemy of Christ swimming around in that pool. So you really don't know what to expect when a mermaid approaches you, just a heads up. Could be a demon, could be a good omen, could be a million dollar reward, could eat you, who knows. Number five. Wales. In 1603, off the coast of Wales, numerous reports were flooding in about the sea creature humanoid fish thing, right? This time it wasn't a sailor, it wasn't a dehydrated, confused captain on a boat who thinks that he sees an island, I don't know. This time it was near Pendeen. It was a farmer named Thomas Reynolds, and he first saw it nearby on the shores, and then, you know, like a normal dude, he called others over to also take a look. He didn't start offering it money or trying to offer it room and board or draw it. He was like, hey, someone else, come look at this. He can't take a photo back then, obviously, so he calls for eyewitnesses. And they all stood by and apparently they watched this thing splash around for three hours straight. Also pretty creepy, guys. Like, let's maybe, you know, don't stare. All the accounts were collected and since it was 1603, some guy actually had to draw it out. And this was the closest they could get to a description. I mean, that's believable and all, sure, but I really hope that this was a mermaid. Or else a bunch of guys probably gathered around and watched some fish uh, mate for three hours. That's more than likely what ended up happening. Number four, Roman Seacrest. All the way back to the first century. Here we go. A good place to begin with most things that are horrible. Romans did things a little different back then. We can't figure out how they engineered aqueducts or how that many people watched Colosseum battles without throwing up. I can't watch an arm bar, let alone bring my family to the Colosseum. My God. But ancient Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, he wrote a book on natural history. And in said book, this go-to today on ancient history, the Elder wrote about 
about half human, half fish creatures that he called nereids. Yeah, he even added to this first observation detailing that the human parts of the body were covered in rough scales. Human in appearance, but still fishy nonetheless. The elder also recalls a seaman who would climb ships at night and then sink them. Yeah, he would also recall Aquaman. So who knows at this point what's real? Terrifying. Imagine Jason Momoa rolling up, stealing all your shit, middle of the night. No, thank you. Number three, Kai Islands. Back in 1943, Japanese soldiers were posted up on the Kai Islands in Indonesia. Now they all claimed to have run into a mermaid numerous times. Just like the Zimbabwe Dam, it's like that's their territory almost, right? It's like they've approached and then kicked people out. On the Kai Islands, there have been multiple encounters with multiple mermaids, not just one that reoccurs, a group, like, Avatar 2, just like a family comes out and you're like, oh, hello, hi. The villagers referred to these creatures as Orang Ikan. Orang translates to human, but Ikan translates to fish. Therefore, human fish. While on patrol, Sergeant Taro Hariba had instructed the village chief to pass on any information if anybody sees one of these things. Obviously, because, you know, why, of course, we'd want to know. So somebody saw one, they captured it, and Sergeant Hariba recalls the mermaid as being around five feet tall, skin was pink ish, and its face was human but it had spikes around their head and its mouth was that of a fish's mouth. So yeah, pretty hard to forget, I'd say. That would be a stained image in my head. I wouldn't sleep. Now this was 1943, so the scientific community wasn't exactly sold yet, right? Nothing really ever came from this, but I weirdly believe this one. A carp mouth is more believable than a silvery blonde hair singing by the ocean. Know what I mean? If it's terrifying and gross, odds are it's probably real. Number two, Kalua Papa. Heading over to the beautiful Hawaii for this one. I always wanted to go, but the thing is, islands in the middle of the ocean terrify me. And also haunted villages with mermaids. Definitely a no-go. We don't like those. This one was once referred to as the most cursed place on earth. It was the coast of Molokai and it sounds like a good time on paper and from Google Earth it certainly looks like a fair weekend getaway. But for over 100 years this was an isolation coast for patients with leprosy. That of course had to change sometime and the laws did in 1969. And right now barely anybody is living on that part of the island due to its haunted past. Leprosy was considered a curse back then but even when help became available some elders elderly patients stayed. Some refused to leave the island. So a few thousand people were stuck on this island for 10,000 years and there's been numerous, you guessed it, mermaid sightings. So did they leave because of leprosy or did they leave because of the mermaids? Right? Did the mermaids kick them out or were they like, you know what, this place is awful. We're all getting sick, let's leave. I personally, if I saw a half fish, half human creature, I'd be like, good enough for me. I'm gonna head this way, cheers. And finally, number one, Christopher Columbus. Well, in this one on one of the worst of the worst, yeah, Mr. Columbus, why not? On his first trip overseas in 1493, Christopher Columbus claims to have seen not one, not two, but three mermaids. Yeah, look at that. Should have been looking at the map, guy. He even wrote about it. He said they rose right out of the sea, but they're not so beautiful as they are said to be. For their faces had some masculine traits. Okay, one, rude, sure. But they're actually not that attractive because they look like guys, I guess. Thanks, Chris, that's a bit messed up. Historians believe that Mr. Columbus here may have gotten confused, <laughs> classic him, and then he saw manatees instead of mermaids. He was fascinated. This guy's looking at manatees like, oh my God daydreaming about hooking up with one of them. Their skin is pink and fleshy, so that's a fair mix-up, I guess, to a human being. Maybe that's what everyone's been seeing this whole time. I mean, yeah, that's probably terrifying to see. I'd leave an island after seeing that, but still, I kind of want to believe. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Godzilla shark. With a name like that, this creature is surely anything but disappointing. About 300 million years ago, these guys ruled the sea and were one of the most terrifying sea creatures ever on our planet. Fossils of these guys have been found in the Manzano mountains which lie east of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they were found in 2013 by paleontologist John Paul Hodnett. So think of a massive shark, but now picture it covered in scales, like a reptile. Okay, now add 12 rows of super sharp teeth, and also the largest dorsal fin spines of any shark that has ever lived. Okay, now you've pretty much got the Godzilla shark. It was nicknamed the Godzilla shark because of its size, as the skeleton is the largest fossil of its kind ever discovered in the area, as well as the fact that its fin spines are so intriguing to look at. While it was called the Godzilla shark upon its discovery, it has since received a more official name of Hoffman's dragon shark, both to honor the family that owned the land where the skeleton was found, and as an homage to its monstrous and reptilian appearance. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Shastasaurus. This extinct genus of Ichthyosaurus is one of the largest marine reptiles known, growing to be 21 meters long. One of the most interesting things about these guys is that they were quite specialized because they had quite a wild food preference. These guys had a thirst 
for squid. A study of their fossils revealed that they had short snouted skulls, which has led experts to believe that their jaws had the ability to open extremely quickly and very wide. This happened so fast it created a sort of vacuum inside of their mouth, sucking in anything that was in front of it. These guys didn't bother with teeth or strong jaws, they didn't need a crazy bite force or really to even move that quickly. They basically just needed to swim over to wherever their desired squid was hanging out and uh, open their mouth. In our number 8 spot today we have the Dunkleosteus. Dunkle Dunkleosteus. I don't know man. This creature was a genus of Plasoderm, which is a class of fish that has been extinct for around 360 million years. These ancient swimmers had osteoderms, which means that they had these plates of exposed bone that served as protection. It's like a built in armor. These guys were some of the largest and most powerful Plasoderms ever, and it had a terrifying ability that made it quite a worthy predator. It was their insanely powerful bite force, which has been estimated to be about 7 750 kilograms. That's wild. This has led experts to believe that these guys may have been a hyper carnivore, which means that they were feeding on some pretty tough prey. Other creatures that have outer protection like they do. Ammonites, they were able to chew through some pretty tough exteriors. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Mausaurus. These guys are a creature that was once very real, but they are thankfully a relic of our past because they are absolutely horrifying. They are named after the Maori god Maui, who is said to have pulled the islands of New Zealand up from the sea floor, so anything named after him is of course going to be an absolutely ginormous beast. The neck of this creature measured around 49 feet long, which is the longest proportionate neck of any animal. The entire creature measured around 66 feet long, so it's clear that their neck counted for a very large portion of their body. But like, imagine a swimming dinosaur creature with a huge snake for a neck. That's kind of what these guys were like. These guys lived on Earth during the Cretaceous period, which is good news for us, but not so much for the creatures that lived at that time. Creatures would jump into the water to avoid a T-Rex only to find this guy waiting for them. Yeah. No thank you. In our number 6 spot today we have the Helicorprion. This animal existed somewhere around 250 million years ago, and while it looks more like a shark than anything else, scientists now know it was actually a creature that is related more closely to chimeras, which are a fish that separated from the shark family about 400 million years ago. So why is this animal just scary and terrible to look at? Well, that is due to the incredibly unsettling spiral saw formation of teeth that this creature had right on their lower jaw. Yeah, an orthodontist's dream, truly. It's also not like this creature was just born with the teeth that they had for the rest of their lives. No, of course not. They had teeth that could grow and new teeth could even form. Imagine being in the ocean and you see a huge creature swim up to you that has four spiral saws for teeth. No. In our number 5 spot today we have the Megalodon. Is any terrifying prehistoric sea creatures list truly complete without an appearance from the Meg? Megalodons are one of the largest sharks to have ever existed. They were huge, they were terrifying, they were apex predators, and they are the creatures that inspired the tales of Jaws, or the Meg. The teeth on these sharks are so large that they are three times larger than the teeth of a modern great white shark. With a teeth that size, you can only imagine how large this shark would have been. It's pretty tough to figure out exactly why the Megalodon died out. I mean, they were one of the largest, scariest creatures who shouldn't have had any trouble finding food, but that might not be the case. Some believe it was the cooling water, others believe it was the competition for food, whatever the case in the end, while the Megalodon is an incredible creature in history, I think we can probably all breathe a sigh of relief that they aren't currently swimming around our oceans. Or are they? In our number 4 spot today we have Cretoxyrena. Measuring about 7 meters long, these creatures aren't necessarily the largest on this list full of prehistoric giants, but that does not mean it is any less terrifying. Fossil evidence has shown us that these creatures were ready to attack just about anything and everything that ended up in front of them. It could be a 4 meter long fish, a marine reptile like a mosasaur, or even a large turtle, it doesn't matter. The key to what made these guys so incredibly ferocious is their 
special teeth. Their teeth adapted to have a much thicker enamel, which meant that they were exceptionally resilient. This is perfect when you're trying to cut through shells and bones. These teeth are actually what landed these guys with the nickname of the Jinsu shark, which is named after the famous commercial for Jinsu knives, which are shown slicing through metal cans. In our number three spot today, we have the Jacolopterus. Okay, I've got three words for you. Giant sea scorpion. Yeah, I'm not going in the prehistoric ocean. This eight foot long arthropod lived in the water with its gross, too large pincers and claws, and honestly, it looks like something out of the movie Alien. These guys had segmented bodies, and they are actually the largest known arthropod to have ever existed here on Earth. They had multiple specialized limbs, and some of them even had spikes. Like, for example, their 18 inch spiked claw that was used to snatch fish as it passed by. It is said that some of these guys would crawl out of the water in order to mate and sometimes shed their outer skin. And all I have to say about that is imagine finding an eight foot long molt of one of these creatures on the beach right before going in for a swim. You wouldn't, right? I'd swear off all water after that. I'm not even drinking it anymore. I don't want any part of what these guys got going on. In our number two spot today, we have the Tylosaurus. These creatures belong to the family of Mosasaurs, and they have long eel-like bodies that allowed them to smoothly cruise through the waters. They had the ability to have intense bursts of speed that propelled them to their prey, which they could quickly take down. The snout of these creatures is thought to have been quite large and rather robust compared to other species of Mosasaurs, which has led researchers to believe that they may have used it to their advantage. To do this, they might have rammed into larger prey so that they were stunned. This gave them time to turn around and finish the prey with their large jaws. Despite these specialized skills, it seems as though these guys weren't very picky with what they ate, as they have been found with all kinds of remains in their stomach area. These creatures were very large, but they were also way faster and more agile compared to their family members. What more could you want in a pre historic predator. In our number one spot today, we have the Leeds fish. This is a fish that lived in the oceans of our world from the middle to the late Jurassic. They are the largest ray finned fish and among the largest fish that are known to have ever existed. The discovery of these fish has been a bit troublesome because of the fact that their skeletons aren't completely made of bone. There were large parts of them made of cartilage, which did not fossilize. Because of this, it is difficult to estimate their true size, with estimates in the past ranging as large is 30 meters or 98 feet. More recent research, however, has lowered this number to the still exceptionally large measurement of 16 meters or 52 feet. Despite their large size, however, these fish weren't terrifying apex predators and instead were a part of a lineage of large filter feeders. These fish had gill arches that were lined with gill rakers, which had quite a unique system of bone plates that allowed them to filter the plankton from the sea water, which was their main source of food. Number 10. Longisquama. Longisquama is a very crucial genus of extinct reptile. I feel like I already sound like David Attenborough, dude. The Longisquama in Cygnus from the middle to late Triassic formation. That was not bad. That was not bad. Come on. Longisquama means long scales. In Cygnus means small. The Longisquama in Cygnus is notable for a number of long structures that appear to grow from its skin. Little mohawk boys, you know? These things were rad looking. They were diepsids, which was a reptile subclass. A small group of climbing and gliding reptiles. Little jumper dudes. These guys were awesome. Little mohawk tree dudes. They lived in forests located on the supercontinent once called Pangaea. Its most notable feature is a double row of long scale like pins running along its back, forming six to eight pairs. It had one pair of scales for each of its pair of ribs, like knight's armor, little mini tectonic plates mixed with feathers on top, and we get Longisquamous scales. Could be rows of wolverine claws, could be rows of feathers or dragonflyish wings. Scientists still don't know. This little mohawk boy is sick though. Little flying dude. Those are definitely little dragonfly wings, I'm calling it. Number nine, Carnotaurus. Okay, Kyle and I, we had a different dinosaur animated movie growing up as kids, okay? Today you've got the little dinosaur that's cute, that's great animation. Back when we were younger, we had the scary dinosaur movie. Remember that one? Where none of them talked with the Carnotaurus guy as the villain. Yeah, that one didn't talk. It was just the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm pretty sure I walked out of that theater. Didn't say a peep. And this guy didn't have to, really. Look at him. The Carnotaurus was a unit. Yeah, they thankfully disappeared 69 million years ago. 
nice. They were around the same size as a T-Rex, coming in at about 29 feet long, but they were nicknamed meat-eating bulls. So, yeah, that ought to tip you why they were the villains in said movie. They would run at about 25 miles an hour. They're one of the fastest and largest moving theropods to ever live. Its arms were smaller than that of a T-Rex, so we can roast them in some capacity, okay? We got them on some, you know, on something. But honestly, it didn't matter because this one had horns, hence the meat-eating bull alias. It was rediscovered in 1984 by Jose Bonaparte in Argentina. They've only discovered one skeleton of these things, so hopefully there weren't too many of these poking around. Yeah, Ana Linda took me to see this one. I'm pretty sure I walked out. It fucked me up good. The scary guy, he runs out so fast. God, he's so fast. Number eight, Plesiosaurus. Ah yes, the Plesiosaurus. A genus of extinct, very large marine reptile that lived during the early Jurassic period. It is known by nearly complete skeletons from the waters and rocks in England. It is known for its small head, long and slender neck, broad turtle-like body, short tail, and two pairs of large paddles for limbs, and is apparently the legendary, the one and only Loch Ness Monster. Cue the bagpipes. The first complete skeleton of a plesiosaurus was discovered by paleontologist and fossil hunter Mary Anning in Jurassic Age rocks December 1823. Plesiosaurus are moderate size compared to what it was swimming around them at the time, usually only about 5 meters in length, and about 500 pounds. They had the head like a big pit bull, and the teeth like a big pit bull. They fed mainly on clams and snails. Okay, this is like a medium scary now, all of a sudden. Number seven. The Great Auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the Great Auk would grow 30 inches long, which isn't too scary, but hear me out. It had tiny wings that would only be used to swim. They were only 13 centimeters long. Kinda cute, but again, hear me out. They were small and jarring to look at. I mean, if this thing was coming at me today, I'd certainly have a rough time. But thankfully for hungry sailors, the Great Auk was greatly defenseless. Yeah, oops, sorry, we got a little, little snacky. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most, if not all, these great ox were living and thriving. Yeah, Newfoundland looked like the iceberg in Club Penguin. It was just like, mm, stacked, just looking real good. Now the iceberg in Club Penguin is gone, as are these guys, so, you know, not a bad bit. Also, I'm broken inside, I miss Club Penguin, RIP. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman, hunted on LD Island, just off the coast of Iceland. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs. Remember those jars of organs, those guys with the random jars of exotic bird pieces? They come in handy, apparently. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-built ox. So yeah, the organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one. Number six. Horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs are marine water arthropods of the family Lemulidae. Despite their name, they are not actually anything like crabs or crustaceans. Then what are they, dude? They are technically chalicerates, most closely related to arachnids like spiders and scorpions. Awesome. Like, what are we looking at here? What, what is this thing? Fossil records for horseshoe crabs extend back as far as 480 million years ago. Nice, thank God. Wait a second, nope, they're still around. Ha! <laughs> These shelly dudes like to keep it shallow, however, in murky waters, mostly in Southeast Asia. Horseshoe crabs use hemocyanin to carry oxygen through their blood, which actually turns their blood blue due to the copper in said proteins. This feature is similar to what white blood cells do for us, and because of this, these guys are unfortunately blood harvested every year by us for medicine. Non-lethal, which involves collecting and bleeding the creature and then releasing them back into the sea. Yeah, I'd be way too scared to grab this thing. Are you kidding me? Like, I respect the animal kingdom, but like at a distance. Number five, Linenicus. It's not a Decepticon, it's a Linenicus. Close though. If you thought a T-Rex had tiny arms, wait till you see this little dude. Linenicus monodactylus, these guys roamed the lands of Mongolia 65 million years ago. I'm a fan of this dinosaur. Honestly, it's scary, and I get that, but I would honestly own this one as a pet. It was actually just giving the other dinosaurs the middle finger its entire life, basically, if you look at them. It had a little arm and one finger with one claw. That's what kind of situation. It was like Wolverine. It was like the, the, the chick from Wolverine, but the one scratchy thing instead of the three. She had the one. Or Deadpool from the X-Men that no one liked. Also, one blade. That one didn't work. In terms of these other monsters on this list, it's quite small. So, you know, maybe just one little kick to the neck. Maybe you'll survive. Coming in at the size of a parrot, this little guy laid eggs and carved through everything and anything that snuck into their nest. Yeah, it was a carnivore. So, T-Rex, Velociraptor, this little guy, all coming after you. If you don't hit that thumbs up, he's gonna get his middle finger and poke you. Number four, 
the Glyptodon, basically an ancient armadillo. Yeah, now we're talking. With its rounded bony shell house and squat limbs, it resembles a giant dinosaur turtle, aging it between 5.3 million to 12,000 years ago. This thing was old, old. Glyptodon meaning grooved tooth because of its square teeth. This thing was big, 10 feet long, weighing as much as like 4,000 pounds. Like picture a Volkswagen Beetle. This giant armadillo existed in present day North and South America. Though the Glyptodon had a powerful tail and an armored back made of a thousand bony plates, it likely lived a fairly peaceful existence. Vegetarian, nice smile, this thing was killing it. It mostly ate grass and never really had to even worry about getting into fights. That being said, the Glyptodon could easily defend itself. I mean, Captain America's shield for a back and a sledgehammer for a tail. It could literally Hulk smash said car. Early hunters likely stalked the Glyptodon for meat and its shell. To kill it, they had to turn it on its back, basically tipping over a car. Yeah, gotta give it up to the early humans. They were badass and strong. Number three, Spinosaurus. Another Jurassic Park star, and rightfully so. The largest carnivorous dinosaur of all time, even bigger than a T-Rex. Can you imagine that? I feel sick to my stomach already. 93 million years ago, they stopped terrorizing the lands of what is now Egypt and Morocco. Now, if you didn't already guess, its name translates to spine lizard, and that spine was quite long. Coming from me, like, that says a lot. The Spinosaurus would measure up to 60 feet long, and aside for its back, one of the most notable features is its six foot long head. Yeah, not neck, six foot long head. That's an Egyptian god. That's like, this is terrifying. Its mouth was similar to a crocodile's with straight, sharp teeth. He would just do the alligator smack and then just chomp the shit out of you and yours. Paleontologists from the University of Pennsylvania believe that this guy used to swim as well. Because where the first Spinosaurus fossil was found, that used to be the Beharia Oasis in Egypt, a massive swamp. Water or land, I want nothing to do with it. Long mouth, stretch neck McGee, stinky ancient alligator breath, get out of here. Never. Turtles, not even. Number two, Megalania. Megalania. The Varanus priscus. This extinct species of giant monitor lizard is a part of the megafauna that inhabited Australia during the Pleistocene. It is the largest terrestrial lizard known to have existed, reaching an estimated length of seven meters. Yeah, length of a killer whale. Weighing around 5,000 pounds. Megalania is thought to have had very early and similar ecology to the modern Komodo dragon. The fossils of lizards in Australia date back around 50,000 years ago. The First Nations peoples of Australia encountered these ancient dragons, and we actually hunted these things way, way back. These things can sprint three meters a second, Taylor. God, he's so fast. Whenever I'm tired at the gym, I'm just gonna picture this giant lizard just like trucking behind me. From its size alone, scientists suggest it would have fed mostly upon large sized marsupials and mammals such as the Australian lion. Oh, that's good. Yeah, this thing ate lions, dude. With its heavily built limbs and body, a large skull, a jaw full of serrated blade-like teeth. Some scientists regard Megalania as the apex predator for the last thousands of years. Um, yeah, I'd like to think so. It's Australia too, dude. That makes it like 18 times worse. Oh yeah, and it was venomous. Of course, of course. And finally, number one, Titanoboa. The worst for last. Here we go, my sweet bees. The Titanoboa was over 40 feet long. That's two thirds of a bowling lane. In case you want to imagine it in your head. There you go. Every time you let that ball go, just think. Snake, 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 still snake. That's how long it was. It's quite horrifying. And if we were born 58 million years ago, we'd have to avoid being eaten by this thing. Again, we grew up watching Anaconda, okay? We know how scary these things can be, especially when Angelina Jolie's dad's running the ship. He doesn't know the maps well. He's gonna take it into a swampy area. Snake's gonna come out, ruin the day. Paleontologists found this beast recently. Its fossil was excavated back in 2004, believe it or not, in Colombia near Lake Maracaibo. But it wasn't until 2009 where it was publicly described. Yeah, it took them five years to be like, should we tell them? I don't know, why should we? I mean, do we have to? So far, we only have the remains of 30 adult Titanoboas. That's 29 too many, if you ask me. I say we, like ourselves, have one. No, we don't have it. I I imagine that, I'd be sick. Even people who have snakes as pets, I'm never gonna visit. Sorry, you're alone for the holidays this time. Just you and your snake with a human name for some reason. Enjoy it. He doesn't bite. I'm like, cool, I still don't like him. 
Starting off at number 10 is the Japanese spider crab. This isn't the type of crab you'll see staring back at you from the fish counter of a metro. These guys usually sit around 1,000 feet deep below the waterline. Growing up to 15 inches wide, the spider crab can weigh an average of 44 pounds. To give some perspective, the average crab usually weighs one third of a pound. Spider crabs also earn their name as unlike the average crab, their legs are extremely long, wide, and spindly, suspending the body up the way a daddy long leg spider would kind of look. Native to the Pacific Ocean, it's one of the largest known anthropods, a group of invertebrate animals that includes lobsters, spiders, and insects. No need to be scared, however, these guys are known as gentle giants that scavenge dead animals and plants. They're also part of the decorator crab group, who like to adorn their shells with sponges and other corals. Crab fashion, that's kind of nice. Next up is meme material, number nine, the blobfish. The winner of 2013's Ugliest Animal Award, the blobfish is gelatinous with no bones and pretty much no muscle either. Now, it resides at 3,000 feet deep, where it looks a lot less out of place as that deep, the water pressure hits about 120 times that of surface level. The intense level of water pressure would be hard to endure without being a gelatinous husk, so it appears this creature had just adapted. When you see images or drawings of the blobfish and what it looks like in the correct water pressure, its body actually formulates together and looks like a close to normal everyday fish. The blobfish, unlike many other fish, doesn't have the air sac in its gut that aids in buoyancy. If a fish with one is removed from its habitat, sometimes the air sac escapes through the fish's mouth and brings its organs and insides out with it, which is a nasty way to go. Blobfish, however, doesn't have an air sac and relies on the water pressure to be its structural support and buoyancy, thus regaining its shape and water pressure. Go blobfish! Take this as a lesson in body shaming. Being different isn't bad. Sometimes it means you aren't in the right environment and you need a little support. Number eight on the countdown, however, gets no slack. It's an ugly and evil undersea Pinocchio, the goblin shark. Known for being a living fossil, the goblin shark has swum in the oceans of the world for the last 125 million years, when primitive mammals were just starting to be recorded. Similar to the blobfish, it has a pale pinkish color due to translucent skin. The common result of living 4,300 feet deep. But these terrifying creatures have been seen as high as 130 feet deep late at night. It's earned its goblin title, with 53 long fangs protruding from the upper jaw and 62 from the bottom. Its bulging jaw protrudes from its face, no longer than the ridiculous long forehead nose thing. To make matters worse, this animal slingshots just its jaw forward from its face to hunt. For perspective, if a human were capable of doing that, we could eat something that was seven feet away from us. It's too deep for a goblin shark to pose any threats to humans, and God please, let's keep it that way. Oh, and we're back to bugs. Number seven, the giant isopod. My bug phobia people from point 10 may start hating me because this crustacean resembles a jumbo potato bug. Living on the ocean floor, it's in the family of shrimps and crabs, but actually the roly-poly potato bugs that hang out in your gardens as well. Now the deep sea version is a little bigger, growing as big and sometimes bigger than 16 inches with a whopping 14 legs. Research requires extensive submersible to observe them over long times, and there aren't many people formulating research around them, so there's still a lot about these creatures we don't know much about, such as their mating, birthing, and internal functions. Why is it so expensive to research? The giant isopod lives in an extreme habitat, the deep sea. They live an average of 1,600 feet or lower, where there's less than one millionth of the sunlight found on the surface of the water. A level of perceivable darkness you and I will never see. Speaking of unseemly creatures of dark depths, the giant squid of folklore is number six on the countdown. Okay, if you have heard about this, it was likely in a fictional movie or a novel depiction, so I'm saying that doesn't count, because many people don't know that the giant squid is a real creature. In Japan, on April 25th of 2022, hundreds of people got that reality check when a still living giant squid washed up on the shores of a beach. Normally, a shore wash up occurs after they've passed and their bodies are rocked by water currents. It was abnormal that a living one washed up, and this big guy was packed up and sent for rehabilitation at a Japanese aquarium where he remains today. In the case of the 2022 jumbo, the squid was 9.8 feet long. That's actually pretty small. The average giant squid is 50 plus feet in length. Their eyes, which are one foot in diameter, are the largest found on any living creature, and its enormous tentacles are allowed to grab prey from even 30 feet away. But there is always a bigger fish. While these squids don't have many predators due to the effects of giantism having the upper hand, their beaks or tentacle remnants have been found in the stomachs of sperm whales. That's one big batch of calamari. And number five on the countdown is 
first in line for that calamari, the frilled shark. Like the goblin shark, the frilled shark is considered a living fossil status. This shark has barely ever evolved from the state in which it was first discovered, or ever. It has next to no surviving relatives either. The frilled shark gets its name from the frilly appearance of its gill slits. But don't be deceived by a cute name, its appearance is grisly and prehistoric. It has a visual element of an eel, but arguably also an alligator. Its long cylindrical body reaches a length of nearly 7 feet and its fins are placed far back on its body. Frilled sharks are active predators who may lunge at potential prey, swallowing it whole even if it is quite large. They have been known to feed on fish, eels, and their favorites being squid and even other sharks. What's most strange, however, is how this creature breeds. Frilled sharks reproduce via internal fertilization and give live birth. However, they do not connect through a placenta like most mammals. Instead, their embryos live off of their own yolk sacs, and only after the juveniles are able to survive on their own does the mother give birth to her young. This is said to be the longest gestation period of any creature, taking up to three years. That essentially is like if a human somehow kept their baby inside of them until it was a toddler. Ugh. Finally, some light in the darkness. Quite literally. Number four is the elusive glass octopus. You know the scene in American Beauty where that creepy kid next door is like romantically enamored by the visual of a plastic bag in the wind? Not gonna lie, that's kinda how I felt watching the footage of this almost ethereal being as it floated around in the dark depths. Now, unlike the plastic bag that little twit fawned over in the movie, this is worth going gaga over. Researchers from the Schmidt Ocean Institute released footage of an elusive glass octopus off the coast of the remote Phoenix Islands, located more than 3,200 miles northeast of Sydney, Australia. It was originally discovered during their 34-day Central Pacific expedition, where for 182 hours, they scanned the seafloor. During this scan, they found the beautiful glass octopus. The species gets its names from its almost translucent body, with only its cylindrical eyes, optic nerves, and digestive tract appearing opaque. They can grow about 1.5 feet long and are estimated to live only 2 to 5 years. As you may remember from the goblin shark or the blobfish, deep sea animal development is shaped around the lack of sunlight and around water pressure. And glass octopus is no exception, living at an average of 3,000 feet deep. The glass octopus lives deep, hard to reach places, so there's much we don't know about this translucent and luminescent cephalopod. There have been only a few sightings and a couple remains found in animal stomachs. Personally, I could watch it swim around all day. But we have to move on. So number three is the barrel eye fish. Nothing I title this segment as can prepare you for the picture you're going to see. Averaging a water depth of 2100 feet, footage of this creature was caught on an ROV camera in the Monterey Submarine Canyon, the deepest submarine canyon of the Pacific coast. This species has only been spotted and reported nine times, despite over 5600 deep dives being done in this fish's habitat. The barrel eye fish first appeared very small out in the blue distance, but I immediately knew what I was looking at. It couldn't be mistaken for anything else. This was said by Thomas Knowles, a senior aquarist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. But why was it so distinctive to him? Well, this bizarre fish has a translucent forehead and face, which actually looks through using a pair of bulbous green eyes that are inside its head. That's right, I'm saying the whole body is just normal opaque fish body, but its head, and ironically the back fin too, are entirely transparent. They can move their eyes to look forward, but they mainly look up in search for prey. Imagine we all had a layer of skin over our eyes, but it was see-through. Yeah, that's that thing's life. So you can see through this creature's entire musculatory and structural system, and more importantly, it can look back through it at you. Number two in the countdown has me happy photos get added in post. The red hand fish, which I swear I can't look at this thing without a little bit of a laugh. This guy's just too funny looking. Part of the angler fish family, these little fishies have little arm and hand like fins that they use to walk across the ocean floor rather than swim. Found in the Australian and Tasmanian waters, the little guys are thought to have a measly population of just 100 adults. It's a low reproductive rate and a low dispersal rate and it makes it a challenge for the species survival. Fragmentation of the population is also a challenge for reproductive success success as the only two reported colonies are in Tasmania and Australia and aren't near each other and don't interact as far as we know. Growing to about 15 centimeters long, its skin has scales reminiscent of teeth and can also come in colorations such as spotted or pink. To help attract their prey, which are other small fish, they have a fluffy lure on their forehead. Like other angler fish, they're ambush predators, which means they prefer to sit and wait amongst seaweed, sponges, coral, etc. for their prey to swim past before they strike. Recent government funding will help build resilience against threats to the wild, red handfish populations. Either way, this is one fish you'll always catch red-handed. Huh? Yeah? Alright, alright. Finally, number 
number one is one silly freaky dude with a weird name, the Black Swallower. This is our deepest sea buddy discussed so far. Surviving at a depth of 10,000 feet, which is 30 times the length of a football field, this fish is a shocking only 9 inches. But this fish embodies the message that size doesn't matter. Thanks to a balloon-like stomach, large mouth, and jutting lower jaw, it can swallow other fish and ocean life whole. Similar to how snakes can swallow a whole deer, it can consume oceanic life up to twice its length and 10 times its weight. Its hooked inward pointing teeth retract to make room for the prey and then interlock to keep it inside. But gluttony is a sin and if they take on too much fish or they simply just gorge too much, their meal can sit in their expandable stomach decomposing and releasing gases and then it becomes a race between those gases and digestion. Sometimes luck isn't on their sides and the gas in their stomach inflates to the point of buoyancy and carries the fish upward thousands of feet into the low pressure water zone, which is an uninhabitable space for a high pressure creature, resulting in their demise. Despite the risk of floating themselves up to death, their eat first, ask questions later strategy is clearly working out for the species. Black swallowers are very abundant in the temperate and tropical Atlantic as well as the Gulf of Mexico. Remember that the next time you hit the beaches on a Mexican getaway trip.